Now we're going to talk about applications to geometric sequence. And one big application is annuities. And an annuity an annuity is a sequence of equal regular payments to an account that has a fixed interest rate. And so, for example, if you think about maybe having a savings account, and every month you have a certain amount of money that's taken from your paycheck and put into your savings account and deposited. And then on top of that, the bank multiplies by the interest rate at the end of each month to calculate the interest that you earned for that month. So every month they're multiplying by the same rate to find the new amount. And then we add in the old amount. So when we find the interest rate, we keep multiplying by that same fixed rate to find your interest for each month. So that would be a geometric sequence because we keep multiplying by the same amount every time to get the next term. However, when you want to add it to the previous month to get the total balance, that's when you start doing partial sums where you're going to add the previous terms. So you want to add all the previous months together to get the new balance. So that's when you're going to be doing partial sums for geometric sequences. And so the annuity formula is derived using geometric sequences and partial sums of geometric sequences. Now the formula for the value of an annuity, we write down FE for future value, and then we take PMT, which represents the payment amount, so that's the amount that you're saving each time you put it into the account. And then we have 1 plus R over N raised to the power of NT minus 1. And that's all over R divided by N. R is your interest rate for each year. And when we put the value of R into our formula, we want to make sure that we put it in decimal form. So for example, if the rate was 5%, I don't want to put in R as 5, I want to put it in as 0 0.05. So we always enter our value of R as a decimal, not as percent. The value of N is the number of payments per year. So for example, if I am saving money in my savings account and I'm putting $100 from my paycheck every month into my savings account, because it's monthly, I would be making 12 payments a year. So in that case, my N would be 12. Now some of the other common ones would be quarterly where N would be four. You could have semi-annually, where n would be 2. And if it's annually, n would be 1, because that's one time a year. Your t represents the number of years. When you put the n and the t together, when I take n times t, that will give me the total number of payments I've made. So for example, if I save money over the span of two years, so T would be 2, and if I put money in my account monthly where N would be 12, then if I take 12 times 2, that would be a total of 24 payments that I'm making into the bank to save money. So when you take the N times the T, that will give you the total number of deposits. So looking at the first example, it says 
Determine the value of the annuity for the indicated monthly deposit. Now this is key because it's saying you're doing monthly deposits, you know your value of N is going to be 12 because that's 12 times a year. The number of deposits and the interest. So they're giving you all this information here. Every time you make a deposit to save money, that's $100. Each payment that you're putting into the bank is $100. So your PMT is 100. The total deposits are 36. So that means if this is monthly and you made 36 payments, then that means your T is 3. Because 3 times 12 will give me a total of 36 payments. Your interest rate is 3%. So that means when I plug R into the formula, that's going to be 0.03. So now we're going to plug all this information into our formula to find the amount of money that we're going to have in our bank account. What is our future value if we make 36 deposits of $100 with an interest rate of 3%? So my future value is going to be, I'm going to take 100, which is my PMT, my payment, 1 plus R, R is 0.03, over N, which is 12. I'm going to raise it to the N times T, so that's 12 times 3, which is 36. That's my total number of deposits or payments. I'm going to subtract 1, and then I'm going to divide by 0.03 over 12. Now make sure when you put this in your calculator that you're putting all of these parentheses in. You can use parentheses for the brackets. If you don't put all this in, you also should put parentheses around the whole numerator so the calculator knows that minus 1 is in the numerator. The other thing to watch out for is you don't want to do intermediate calculations round and then do more calculations because if you make intermediate steps and you round for each step, then you're going to throw off your answer. So you want to put this all in your calculator at once or if you do want to do intermediate steps, make sure you carry every single decimal place that the calculator gives you. Now, if you put all of your parentheses in the right place and you're very careful, you should get for an answer $3,762.06. So what this means is for three years, you make monthly payments of $100. And when you add in all the accumulated interest with that $100 that you deposit every month, at the end of the three years, you're going to have $3,762.06. Now, before we go on to work through example two, I want to clarify a common misconception. Back in a previous chapter, we talked about application of compound interest, and we had different formulas for that. Now, the difference between the formulas that we used previously and an annuity formula that we're using now, the annuity formula is when you're making regular payments towards something. Whether you're saving it and you're earning the interest or whether you're paying off a loan, an annuity is just regular payments. And that's the formula that we're using now. The formula that we used previously with compound interest is where we just deposited a lump sum of money and then we sat back and we watched it grow on its own. And for those formulas, we are not making regular payments into the bank and adding to our savings account. So for example, so I can help you understand the difference between the two, you would use the compound interest formula that we used in the previous chapter, if, for example, if I just put in $1,000 in the bank and I walked away and I never touched it again, and all it's doing is accumulating interest only based on that initial deposit that I put in there, versus an annuity, 
is I make regular payments into the bank account. It's not just one time that I deposit money. I'm making regular payments. So that is the difference between the annuity formula that we're using now versus the compound interest formulas that we were using previously. So now, if we look at example two, it says Mike deposits $150 in his bank account semi-annually. So he's making regular deposit. This isn't just I'm making one deposit of $150 and I'm walking away and letting it grow. He is making regular deposits. So bells should go off and think, okay, so this I'm going to use my annuity formula for because annuity is when we have a sequence of regular payments. Semi-annually means N is going to be 2. Our regular payments, it says he's making payments of 150. And it tells us also that he's making 1% interest. So our R is going to be 0.01. And he does this for 25 years, which means T is going to be 25. The question is asking us how much oh, is he going to have at the end of the 25 years? So we need to plug all that information into our annuity formula. So I have my payment, which is 150, and I'm going to multiply that by 1 plus R over N, and N is 2 because it's semi-annually, and we're going to raise that to the power of N times T. So N times T is 50, which means he's going to make a total of 50 payments because he's doing this twice a year for 25 years. Then we got to subtract 1, and that's all over 0.01 over 2. So when I put this in my calculator, I need parentheses for my brackets because the calculator doesn't have brackets. I need parentheses around this that's raised to the 50 power. I need, even though it's not in the formula, when I put it in my calculator, I also need parentheses around the numerator. And then I also need parentheses around the denominator. So we've got a lot of parentheses here, but if we're very careful and we plug it into the calculator correctly, we will get a future value of $8,496.77. Okay, the last example for applications, it says a pendulum travels the distance of 10 feet on its first swing. So if we imagine, I have a pendulum here, and it's swinging back and forth. So on its first swing, it travels a distance of 10 feet. So from here to here would be 10 feet. So if we're thinking in terms of a sequence, our first swing, which is our A1, would be 10 feet. Then it says on each successive swing, it travels only two-thirds the distance of the previous swing. So if I find two-thirds of 10, that's going to give me as a fraction an exact value. It's going to give me 20 thirds feet, which if I put that in decimal form will be about 6.7. And then for the third swing, I got to take two thirds of 20 thirds, which would give me 49 feet. And if I put that in decimal form, that's about 4.4 feet. And then I would continue this until it stopped. And at some point, maybe it's on the 100th swing, it's going to be swinging at such a small pace that that distance is going to be so insignificant that it's not even going to matter anymore. It's going to be like stopped. So if you look at this, what we're doing is we keep multiplying by two thirds to get the distance on each swing. So A1 represents the distance on the first swing. A2 represents the distance it travels on the second swing, etc. So the question is asking us for the total distance it travels until it stops. So we want to add up all the distances for each swing. 
So we want to add a 1, a 2, a 3, because we want the total distance. It doesn't say it wants to know how it traveled on a particular swing. It wants the total distance. So this is going to be an infinite sum. We want to add up all the distances for every swing. So if I write out my nth term, I'm going to have 10, which is my a1, my first swing, the distance for my first swing. And then my r, since I keep multiplying by 2 thirds, that's my common ratio, which is my r. And then this is going to be raised to the n minus 1. This is a geometric sequence because I keep multiplying by 2 thirds. So I can write it in this form. Now, since r is between 1 and negative 1, I know that this converges. So if I add up all the terms of the entire sequence, I'm going to get an actual answer. I can do it. So I can either use the sum formula, the infinite sum formula, which I would take 10 over 1 minus 2 thirds, or I can use my summation notation where I would start at 1, go to infinity, and I would write in my sequence. And on my calculator, since my calculator doesn't have infinity, I would just have to put in a really big number like 1,000 to calculate using the summation notation. But either way, no matter how I do it, I should get the answer of 30 feet. So by the time it stops swinging, it's going to swing once and move 10 feet. Then it's going to swing again, and it's going to move about... 6.7 feet, and then it's going to swing again and move about 4.4 feet. And if we add up all those distances for each of those A's, we're going to get a total of 30 feet.